Denver is ready to sweep another homeless encampment. That must mean more housing is available. I don't know where to go. I'm not from here. I don't know where it's okay and not okay because they don't give us that option. Hang on, a sweep with no housing? How does that fit with Mayor Mike Johnston's plan? I'm speaking because I believe it's the right thing, and I teach my students to use their voices. Teachers in Southern Colorado put their jobs at risk today by doing something terrible, speaking publicly. And the thing about October is that it should be burr from time to time. Will we reach the end of what this cold weather guy thinks is a most unfortunate streak? Find out next. The notices are up for another homeless encampment sweep. This one in Northwest Denver because of public health concerns. How many will be offered a place to stay? Unlike the 83 who camped near the governor's mansion and were given housing last week, none will be offered a hotel room this time. Our Kelly Renke takes a look at why. A strip in Northeast Denver is home when housing is scarce. The two burner grill. This makeshift table is how Kelly Scoville cooks lunch now. Here's what it is. And here's what it is. She hasn't had a kitchen okay. in a year. Kelly's lived near 50th and Dahlia for three months. Where home will be next week isn't clear because of this notice the city posted at her camp. They just passed it out. Moved on to the next one. It was like, get it and get out, you know. Denver's Department of Transportation and Infrastructure is cleaning the area because of health and safety concerns. People living here will have to pack up. The city offered a place in a shelter. It's just not the housing many were hoping for. I'm grown. I don't need a curfew. I know what's right and wrong. This is different than a cleanup last week near the governor's mansion. As part of Mayor Mike Johnston's housing plan, the city offered 83 people at that encampment a hotel room. Kelly and her neighbors won't get that option. The city says the resources are not available right now. There's just no hotel room for them to go to. I miss being able to flip a light switch on. I miss being able to go turn a knob on and Run and water comes out, refrigerator. Dozens of people on this block are learning to survive on the streets. We're not invisible. It's just, this is what has to happen right now. It isn't the way Kelly wants to live, but she feels there's no other choice when housing is scarce. And we have lunch. So I wanted to know why the city prioritized the 8th and Logan site near the governor's mansion, considering the public safety risks at this encampment. Department of Housing Stability says the 8th and Logan spot also have problems, trash and needles, and the cleanup was necessary. They are hoping to relocate more people into hotels and micro communities within the coming weeks. So we know about the 83. They're not adding to that number. And I know mm -hmm. you did some checking on where do we stand with the people who had uh, been housed last week. Are they still housed or where are we at with that up to 1,000? Yeah, it's been a little more than a week since those 83 people were moved to a hotel. So I asked the city how many of those 83 are still at the hotel. They said they don't have an exact count. They said they know a majority of them are staying at the hotel. They're working on their data collection. What's interesting here is they're using this two-week metric mm -hmm. to get to that 1,000 number. And they say that's what's popping up on the dashboard. So it seems like they're kind of working to make sure that they're getting this data collection process going. Okay. But so they're they trying. Have, they're trying. They don't have a number to give me now. I guess we'll just check in on that two-week time to see if they have a number. It's not that we're not going to get that number. It's we don't have know it, it yet. now. So we don't know. I mean, people we could have left know. the housing and not be at that, not they be said, counted. They said a majority of the people are at the hotel. They just couldn't tell me how many. I know you'll stay on it. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks. There is a two-step process getting people off the street and into housing and keeping them housed. There are another group of people who have housing and need help staying housed because of risk of eviction. A coalition of anti-poverty nonprofits wants Johnston to double the city's spending on rental assistance. The mayor's budget request already asks for more than last year, 12 and a half million for rental assistance compared to 8 million the last two years. Federal aid that previously helped fund rental assistance is gone. A dozen nonprofits, including the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless and the ACLU, have asked Johnston to make the budget request $30 million. They estimate that would prevent 2,300 evictions. The city estimates there could be a record 12,000 evictions this year. Johnston's proposal is the most the city would set aside for rental assistance. Again, it was previously paid for through federal money. The nonprofits say the city should dig into the piggy bank, the reserve, to come up to that $30 million number. 
Four city council members have already filed budget amendments seeking that additional money. Denver Public Schools' policy of expelling, or rather not expelling students, might get more teeth. Despite concerns from school administrators regarding school safety, school board members may strengthen the policy to keep potentially violent students in the classroom. Tonight, school board vice president Ayante Anderson said he and two other board members will propose an amendment to the district's discipline policies. The change will require the school district to provide alternatives to expulsion and keep students in their home schools whenever possible. Anderson said the policy will not apply to students who bring weapons to school or engage in, quote, egregious criminal activities on school grounds. We have covered multiple incidents involving students off school grounds, including a student facing charges of attempted murder. In those incidents off school grounds, the district has denied requests from school administrators seeking to expel those students. Anderson told Kyle earlier this year off school grounds is out of the board's jurisdiction. Our responsibility as a district, but more so as a school board, um, is to ensure that everybody has a free, fair, and public education. We're not in the practice of dismissing students because they've made mistakes. What if the mistake is shooting somebody and getting charged with attempted murder? You know, I think that's an opportunity for us as a district uh, to have ensure and make sure that we have a robust safety plan uh, with the student and those family and that family and those impacted. Um, you know, but. I can't um, say that I believe the, you know, the expulsion of a student is what we should be doing or, you know, the, the denying them a free and fair public education, um, especially because some of these instances that we're talking about are happening outside of our jurisdiction um, as, a, as a school district. Anderson said expulsion disproportionately impacts students of color. The district has been using expulsion less just 18 last school year. And with the exception of the pandemic year of 2020, when classes were mostly remote, the number of expulsions has dropped every year since 2018. A middle school teacher pursued an unusual lesson in Woodland Park, how to be insubordinate. You see, she spoke with us about concerns she has with her school board adopting a conservative civics education program that the State Board of Education rejected. Concerns about the school board rejecting mental health grants that would pay mental health workers. Concerns that could be considered insubordination because district policy said she's not allowed to talk to us. Teachers have already sued over that policy because, well, the First Amendment. I have been a teacher in Woodland Park for 15 years and love it. Anna Hand loves teaching at Woodland Park Middle School, but certain words she used in our interview seemed opposite of love. There's definitely that culture of fear. Um, and I'm afraid now. Talking with us could be considered a violation of policy KDDA that says no employee shall be interviewed by the media or offer quote without the written consent of the superintendent. It also limits what they can post on social media with any violation seen as insubordination. I'm speaking because I believe it's the right thing and I teach my students to use their voices to say what they believe. Um, I'm terrified. Terrified to vocally oppose the Woodland Park School Board. So far this year, the board was the first in the nation to adopt the conservative civics education program called American Birthright, which promotes American patriotism and deems social justice and diversity, equity, and inclusion topics to inhibit student learning. The board also rejected applying for mental health grants that could fund mental health employees for students. The school district has lost about 40% of its teachers, including mental health and social workers. I'm thinking of a few in particular that last year I watched go to class, participate in their learning, participate in extracurriculars, and this year they don't have their people, they don't have those supports in place, and they're struggling just to make it day to day. Hand is one of 76 teachers risking insubordination, putting their names on this letter calling on the district to reverse its decision on the social studies standards and mental health funding. Well, and there are many more who would have signed if not for being afraid. A news conference in Woodland Park just ended a short time ago. That list is now up to 81 teachers by name. My email request this afternoon to talk with someone from the school district has received no reply so far. Another Colorado school district may follow Woodland Park by adopting American birthright standards. Garfield County's RE2 school board are going to consider a change. Parents and LGBTQ advocates in that county on the western slope tell us the fallout in Woodland Park is on their minds. Regardless of your political affiliation or regardless of what, you know, curriculum-wise you want 
uh, in the schools. Like these are undeniably really bad outcomes that I think pretty much everyone can say, we don't want 40% of our teachers to leave. We don't want to be spending our budget on lawyers and not textbooks. The RE2, the RE2, that is, board, is expected to vote on American birthright standards at the end of this month. The vote will follow a recommendation from a social studies curriculum review board, which is made up of school staff, parents, and community members. The prosecution called its final witness today in the trial of Aurora police officers involved in the death of Elijah McClain. The 23-year-old died in 2019 after police stopped and restrained him for acting suspiciously, and then paramedics injected him with a sedative when he was doing nothing wrong. Suspended Aurora officer Randy Rodima and former officer Jason Rosenblatt are charged with felonies that could come with more than a decade in prison. Today, the last prosecution witness was on the stand, Dr. Roger Mitchell, a forensic pathologist and medical examiner. He told the jury that McLean died of the ketamine injection while being violently subdued and restrained by law enforcement, lumping the two together as the ultimate cause of death. The defense, which has been trying to blame the paramedics and not the officers, got that witness to admit he considers himself a, quote, advocate who has written extensively about the deaths of black Americans in police custody. The defense is expected to start its case tomorrow morning. It is getting better, but it's not up to par yet. As the largest healthcare strike in healthcare history continues, so do negotiations. In a typical he said, she said, Kaiser Permanente tells us things are improving. Workers say it's still not enough. And a cold front means some parts of Colorado are in for the first freeze. Yay! Oh, but not for us, boo. Well, I guess I haven't blown out the sprinklers yet, so yay! Or, or boo. I'm still debating and I'll be debating during the break. I've opined over the last few weeks about my love of fall, hoodie weather. Not to steal from what Danielle's about to show you, we're in for some October. Northeast Colorado could get its first freeze this weekend, and that's when Denver's first freeze is known to happen. October 7th is Denver's average first freeze. It's unlikely we'll get that cold this weekend, but we might be in for some of our coldest air in months. Denver's temperatures have not dropped below 40 degrees in almost five months. That's the 10th longest streak in history. And Danielle, I don't like the heat in September and October. I don't know how I, else I can say it or, or hide it, but tomorrow, this is my day, right? We're gonna, are we gonna see a three when we wake up? Uh, so it's gonna be Saturday morning. Okay. You'll see a three, right. Right? but you're so excited about it. I love it. Yeah, and then I'll complain about it once I'm out, you know, walking the stroller, oh, and, it's, and then it's like 20 degrees. I'm like, what am I doing out here? Yeah. I can't do this anymore. This is not fun. Yeah, I hear you. But I think everyone's kind of excited for a change up around here, right? We've been looking at above average temperatures for weeks on end. Finally, the numbers are cooling off. We've been in the upper 60s, low 70s for the past few weeks. But now, looking at this cold front rolling in, we will drop into the 50s for highs. And yes, those overnight lows are going to cool off quite a bit. A beautiful afternoon. Oh, my gosh. Plenty of sunshine out there. Bright blue Blue skies, highs in the low 70s for the metro area, a little warmer off to the eastern plains, but look what is coming. Like Marshall said, that cold front charging in from Montana and Wyoming. It'll be here overnight, swing through eastern Colorado and allow that cooler air really to settle in. Not just tomorrow for our daytime highs, but overnight into Saturday morning too. This huge dominant ridge off to the west, that's going to be rolling in for the weekend. And that means a warm up on our hands too. Here is the freeze watch as well as the freeze warning in place. Warning in effect overnight into tomorrow morning, 3 a.m. till 8 for the San Luis Valley. And then the freeze watch early on Saturday morning for northeastern Colorado. Those temperatures as low as about 30 degrees. As this cold front comes in, it's bringing us clouds. No rain, no snow, but it will be a cloudy start to your Friday. By the afternoon, 3, 4 o'clock, we'll be looking at plenty of sunshine around here. Highs though? feeling like hoodie weather, absolutely. Mid 50s for those highs around the metro area, the eastern plains, 50s and 60s to the mountains, and then we jump back to the 70s. We go with plenty of sunshine for the weekend, and then right now, a cool off with rain coming midweek. They might need a hoodie out striking. Thousands of Kaiser Healthcare employees still on strike because they say staff shortages are bad for patients. We sat down with a Kaiser executive who said the healthcare provider is making progress and a religious school that wants to be part of the state's universal pre-K program, as long as they don't have to follow the rules, has its day in court. Next.
3,000 Kaiser Permanente workers will remain on strike through tomorrow while negotiations continue between the nonprofit healthcare giant and a union representing licensed practical nurses, medical assistants, and lab and pharmacy techs who might be able to help my scratchy throat. Today, for the first time, a member of Kaiser's leadership agreed to sit down with us and address employee concerns. We never operate at unsafe levels. We never put our patients at harm. Take a swig of water and call me in the morning. That's Kaiser's VP, Kelly Kane. She's not involved with negotiations, so she couldn't speak to the specifics of what's being bargained. But she said the company is constantly working to fill positions. Kaiser told us it's added a 1,000 union positions in Colorado over the last year and that staffing levels are only down 3% from pre-pandemic levels. Kane said some specialty positions are harder to recruit for, but union members say a drop in staffing means gaps in patient care across the board. There are hot pockets where we do have more trouble recruiting in certain areas than others. So, for example, and this is pretty specific, but for example, certain specialty radiology technicians, MRI technicians. You know, we have 50 patients a day, sometimes more. And for two people to bring back 25 patients or more is crazy. You're running constantly, you're taking half lunches or no lunches, and it's tiring at the end of the day. The 3,000 union members on strike represent nearly 45% of Kaiser's workforce in Colorado. But Kaiser says clinics in Colorado are still open and doctors and other practitioners are still working. Today, a Christian preschool in Chafee County tried to convince a federal judge that the state's requirements to participate in universal pre-K violates the school's religious beliefs. Darren Patterson Christian Academy, Buena Vista, is a pre-K through 8 school. Leaders there filed the federal lawsuit in June, asking a judge to exempt the school from state requirements prohibiting discrimination based on religion, sexual orientation, or gender identity. The suit claims those anti-discrimination protections violates the school's religious right to the, quote, hire those who share their faith and have gender-based dress codes and bathroom rules. The school suing the state's universal pre-K for an exemption to those rules. A federal judge heard arguments in the case today, but has not made a decision. The state's also facing a similar federal suit on behalf of two Catholic preschools who want the universal pre-K program's non-discrimination requirements overturned. I can see the feedback in the distance. I don't know what it says yet, but Marissa's probably got some good stuff. We'll read it next. It's a sign you've gone too far. But if you've gone this far, you've probably missed a couple of other signs. Andrea or Andrea spotted this sign in Pueblo, in Pueblo Reservoir, in the water, that says, no vehicles beyond this point. This is one of those signs that we've talked about before where it's like, that sign's there because you know someone took a vehicle beyond that point, and now they put it up there for legal purposes. If you've got a sign, send it to us next at, hey, next at 9news.com or hashtag HeyNext. The biggest conundrum of the health care strike with Kaiser is from Diane. I had to go to Kaiser today. Everything was well organized from the people striking to the people inside working. It was a hard choice to cross the picket line, but when you need medical care, you need medical care. We've done a lot of stories about the workers and the company itself, but it's the people and the patients that have to go past this. And Diane, I w wonder what the uh, workers said to you. I hope they were kind on your way in and on your way out. Got good medical care, I'm sure.